Don't believe that you can't help. Don't believe that you can't have an impact on someone's life. We all are in a position to help. Everyone can use encouragement and some help or a lift or a hand up. Just get involved. It, it'll make a difference. We're going to do something totally different today. We're going to learn about an organization called Hands of Gratitude that brings people together to assemble prosthetic hands for people around the world. I'm joined by the Hands of Gratitude CEO, Matt Campana, and my colleague, Gina Oliver, who's going to share her experience building prosthetic hands for this group. Matt and Gina, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm honored to be here as well. So Matt, let's just get right down to it and tell us about Hands of Gratitude. Sure. Yeah. Hands of Gratitude is an event that can be utilized either with our corporate partners or school partners. And the end result of the activity is the assembly of 3D printed prosthetic hands. These are functional 3D printed prosthetic hands that we then ship around the world to recipients who have either lost a limb or were born with a limb difference. It's an instantly impactful program. And I'll just say it's taken us on a journey that we never ever could have imagined. <laughs> Okay, what's the event like? Are we 3D printing a hand there at the event or what's happening? So we bring all the materials required, all the tools and all the plastic components and the artwork. Our corporate and school partners will work together in teams of two or three to assemble the prosthetic hand, write a note to our recipient and decorate a canvas that is also shared with our recipient as a keepsake, which show messages of support and encouragement from our client and school partners thousands of miles away from these recipients. At the very beginning, you might be overwhelmed by what's in front of you, but by the end, you're feeling pretty inspired, I believe. So it's really impactful and it has resonated with our school and corporate clients uh, for years now. Gina, you did this not long ago. Was it difficult? Not difficult. I mean, definitely an excellent team building experience. I would say Matt and his colleague were excellent. They led us through. They kind of reassured everybody, okay, I know this might look a little intimidating at first, but we'll all get there together. So they provided just the right amount of support, I think, to get everybody through it. We had people at first who were saying things like, I'm not an engineer. I, I don't have any engineering training. But we quickly overcame our fears. And throughout the whole program, Matt would say, okay, everybody, let's take a break for a moment. And he would give some background information on Hands of Gratitude. He would share videos and snippets of hand recipients. That was excellent because then it gave folks a little break, but at the same time, some very moving context to why we were doing what we were doing and who it was going to help. All in all, it's a great experience. And I feel confident saying I think anyone can do it. It's not so difficult that it can't be done. And then when you're working as a team, that makes it even better. There was an additional component to Gina's program is we actually had a recipient from South Carolina that made her way to the event. So there was actually one team that was assembling a hand for Caitlin. So there was a, a little enhanced pressure on that group, but they handled it with flying colors. It was pretty amazing. And Caitlin was there to encourage them and keep them inspired throughout the build too. Oh, that must be so meaningful. Matt, I'm assuming there's someone like you there to check people's work. Yes. All the completed devices come back with us and we have a quality control process. We actually work with some local Boy Scout troops that are very proficient at knot tying, which is a critical aspect. So the Boy Scout group, not only do they get volunteer hours, but they help us with quality control. This is really smart. I think of team building trustful activities we've all done in the past. And then I hear about this and I'm like, okay, this is brilliant. How would you come up with this idea? That kind of leads into my background. So I didn't even know anyone with a prosthetic and I'm certainly not a doctor. My background is in corporate training and development. So I led many of those programs that you're talking about for 15 years. I started my own company in 2008 to provide a platform for businesses to give back through their meetings and events and retreats. I have a passion for that type of programming. Then. I guess about eight years ago, I was looking for a medical-based give back activity, having no idea what I wanted to do, but stumbled across a video doing research on YouTube of a 3D printed prosthetic hand that was created by an engineer in San Francisco that worked with this little boy named Kieran, who had a fairly typical limb difference condition called amniotic band syndrome. 
one, I was blown away to see that 3D printing has advanced so much that we're able to print appendages for people. I couldn't believe it. So I reached out to the engineer that posted the video and I acquired a couple devices and put them together and took them apart and created hands of gratitude around that personal experience and then have really worked hard to develop it. It's been personally transformative for me, for sure. How have you gotten companies and schools to participate in what's that level of participation look like these days? The whole thing has been organic from finding clients to participate to finding recipients. It's just happened exactly the way that it was supposed to, honestly. So it's really all been generated by word of mouth and repeat business on the client side. We now have worked with some pretty substantial companies, Google and Starbucks and Deloitte and FedEx and Capital One and ACC now. Lots of very reputable big clients that then share their experience. And that's what happens for the next event. On the recipient side, it's organically grown similarly. At the very beginning, we were shipping devices, not really knowing where they were going or what the ultimate outcome was, but that also has grown where we've been introduced to specific NGOs and groups who are trying to grow a cause within their country. NGOs have found us through newspaper articles. We've been recommended by people. So it's really just grown. And now rather than shipping devices and not knowing where they're going, we now have a wait list of recipients around the world. So you and I were talking about scheduling a time to have this conversation. And you were telling me your travel schedule, where some of these recipients are. Can you give us a little preview of where you're going the next few weeks and months? Yeah, yeah. The four projects that are the most active right now are Tanzania, which is the next trip where we have an estimated 700 recipients that are awaiting devices just in Tanzania. So that's certainly going to be a year-long or multi-year effort as we go there. So that's the next trip. Following that will be the Dominican Republic, where we're working with a new prosthetic center called the Centro de Prosthesis. So that's the next trip. And we have some mission trips that are aligned with that trip as well. After that is India, working with the Association of Indian Physicians and Rotary of India. They've identified just under 200 recipients that are awaiting. And then following that will be Guatemala. So those, those are the next four that are on the books anyway. <laughs> wow. Why is there a greater need in some of these places? They just don't have the same luxuries that we are afforded here in the States and many other developed countries. So electrical accidents are the number one cause for limb loss in Central America, just because they don't have the grid that we have. When you walk into a room here, you turn the light on, the light goes on. It doesn't always happen like that. So there are electrical accidents that happen all day, every day. In addition to that, just the other social services like state highway patrol and things in place to keep us safe. So... There are accidents that happen all day, every day, often resulting in limb loss. Public transportation isn't necessarily a thing. What I've witnessed in a lot of developing countries and in India and Tanzania are just loads of people piling into a vehicle and getting to where they need to go. And if there happens to be an accident, then it's tragic. So just so many things that were just taken for granted are major issues for folks in developing countries. What it's opened up, a byproduct of the activity that I couldn't have predicted, is these messages and lessons of empathy and compassion and awareness and acceptance and inclusion and hope and love and gratitude for sure. All these things that play a role into every event, both on the participant side and the recipient side. But yes, to answer your question, it's just a different world in these countries that require our help. I was watching all the videos on your website earlier today, and I saw this story about all the landmines. Yeah, there are still 60 plus countries that have significant landmine issues. And that goes aside from any conflicts that are seemingly happening all the time as well. So roughly 300,000 landmine amputees every year. And that seems to be a growing number as well. How many prosthetics have you made? Do you count? Do you know? We've estimated that we're over 5,000 devices that have been shipped now that we have more clear identified recipients will definitely be able to track that a little more closely. But that number of 5,000 is totaled over the last seven years. And just with the upcoming visits that we've already scheduled, we're going to be over 2,500 just there. So it's sadly growing, but it's 
just amazing that we have the technology that we're able to play a part, not being experts. It's still just mind blowing to me that we're able to do what we're able to do. Yeah. And that you're fulfilling a huge need. Can you just describe the prosthetics and like how they're made? Sure. The first device that was made by the engineer in San Francisco, it looks totally different than the device that we're currently operating with. The reason being is that graciously, it's an open source technology. So we can work with engineers building off of that original design to make it better and better. So the design itself is improving drastically quickly. The operation of 3D printing itself, each device takes about four and a half hours to print on a printer. We have our own printers. We're working with schools that have printers that are often just sitting around. So that's a cool aspect is to engage printing departments at schools to really join in on an impactful activity. But from beginning to end, it takes about four hours to print. And then we have some pre-assembly that we do. We organize all the pieces and parts into color-coded bags. So for teams like with Gina's, it's pretty easy to follow along the instructions if you don't just dump all the bags on the table anyway. So that's the process leading up to the event with the printing and the pre-assembly stuff. Gina, you have two boys. Was this harder or easier or the same as putting together like a complicated Lego set? I would say somewhere in the middle because very similar to Legos and putting together a difficult Lego set. But with the knot tying and having to use some tools, there are a few tools that are provided that help you grab the thread and pull it through. Like I said, some people felt very intimidated at first, but very quickly got comfortable with it. And Matt did a great job of leading everybody. I describe it as simple and complex at the same time. (laughs) Yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. (laughs) All right. How can our listeners get involved? I mean, I'm sure so many people are listening saying, oh, God, we could do this at my kid's school. We could do this where I work. How do they get involved? The best way is to just navigate through the Hands of Gratitude website. Then on the website, there's an inquiry form that can be completed that provides us with some initial information that can lead us to what would be the best program for you or for your clients or listeners. And they can learn more about us and determine if it might be a good fit for their teams. Do they need any expertise? No. I mean, honestly, if you follow the instructions, you'll have success. It sounds like some people will need their reading classes. Here's what you should bring. For sure. Yeah. I've played around with incorporating like minor hats with the lights on them. So you have good (laughs) vision, all those types of things, or maybe Dr. Lamps that would play into the activity because at different times you feel like a surgeon when you're threading tendon line. That's the other thing that's cool is the design is so thoughtful, but it's also dental bands and fishing line that you're using. So it's pretty interesting. I imagine it must feel empowering. Gina, how'd you feel after? Definitely empowered by helping. I mean, that was one of my goals in putting together a team building event for our staff and how I found Matt organically searching on Google. I came across his website. Empowering in that we did it. Like I think (laughs) just like the rest of the team sitting around, we were wondering, are we actually going to be able to do this? So we did it, but also a bit emotional too, because you have the story of your recipient in front of you. You have their name, you have their background. You're getting the information of why they're in need of the prosthetic. And then you're decorating a bag based on that bio that you're provided for them. So it feels like in a small way you're connecting. You feel like, yay, we actually got the hand assembled, which is an achievement in and of itself, right? But at the same time, you're making an emotional connection with the actual recipient. So it was gratifying all around, I suppose. Yeah. I think it's resonated with our clients on a couple different levels too, because everyone's going through something individually. Everybody has been challenged. I feel like with this program, if it was a 10 person event or a 300 person event, there are people within the event that have a direct connection. It might not be with needing a prosthetic device, but it's through some challenge that they've overcome or had to overcome as a parent or as a person. Raising a child with a cleft palate or being bullied or something like that. The activity is, I guess, cathartic in that way. It just provides, like Tina was saying, a personal connection as well. That leads me to a question, Matt. What's the most important thing you want people to take away from this experience? One, don't believe that you can't help. Don't believe that you can't have an impact on someone's life. We all are in a position to help. 
we just get lost sometimes in our own lives, but never underestimate what you can do for sure. Everyone can use encouragement and some help or a lift or a hand up. Secondly, I'm here to learn too. I take something away from every event that we host. There's someone that has an impact on me and our team. We take away something every time as well. But there's outlets out there, whether it's hands of gratitude or something else. Just get involved. It'll make a difference. Gina, do you want to ask any questions or add anything? I do have a question that I've been wanting to ask Matt, which is, where do you see the future for Hands of Gratitude? I mean, where do you see this journey taking you over the next five, 10 years, the organization as well as you as the leader? Great question. So the vision for those projects and whatever projects are down the road is to engage our participants as much as we can in those projects. Be involved. If you want to deliver the hand that you've made, then we can arrange for that to happen. The next is with the schools. I have this vision for kids to really dive in and develop the messages of empathy and compassion and those lessons that you can help as a kid to really inspire these kids to get out of the bubbles that they're in and to understand that they can really make a difference in the world. We have some at-risk youth programming and the messages that have come back from that are truly inspiring. Kids that are in a world of hurt, their message after participating in the program are on along the lines of, I never realized I could help somebody. So I think exploring and really developing the true impact to kids is where I want to take it to. My heart just like, oof, okay. Yeah. I have to say too, just build upon that as a mother of two, one of which has special needs. It is so important for kids to be able to be socialized to the idea that there are other kids that have challenges and that you can help with or that you can certainly at a minimum have some compassion and understanding toward. So programs like this really help with that and make kids really recognize that not everybody is the same and some people need help and compassion. Yeah, thank you, for sure. The device themselves are being celebrated too. It's not a scary, daunting looking device. So kids having grown up with Legos, they really embrace the activity and then to take it to that next level to make them understand that the activity that they already like is helping people. We've had teachers say they identify kids that might be hard to reach in certain activities, it seems to really resonate with them. Those kids that might not fall into your typical education curriculum. I think it's important. I think that's brilliant. I watched a few clips on your website of just some local news stories and I'd heard from some of the kids that had built them. You could tell how accomplished and proud they sounded and also how they were like, oh, there's people that have their own problems. Right, right. Yes, absolutely. Awareness. It's really brilliant. We're talking about schools and kids. Is there a certain like minimum age? What kind of ages are you targeting? So for whatever reason, middle school seems to be a good age, but we've done K through 12 programs. So it's decent for all ages, but if you're looking at a someone doing it mostly on their own, seventh grade girls. <laughs> Mature focused. Yeah, they just seem to be dialed into it too. They, they're they inspiring to watch. <laughs> Matt, Gina, thank you so much for being here, for sharing so much. We are so excited and can't wait to see where Hands of Gratitude goes and want to be a part of it. And I know most of our listeners will as well. Thank you so much. It was just an honor to be here and we couldn't do what we do without folks like you supporting it. So thank you so, so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. And thanks, Matt, for coming on. To our listeners, I hope you're as inspired as Gina and I are. And please go learn more about Hands of Gratitude at their website. I look forward to sustainably speaking with you soon.